The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. We've got hold of an author who has been writing with Cat uh, uh, Winters as well, uh, and uh, they've written a couple of books kind of centered on the Golden State Killer, and so we're going to find out. Um, so here we've got Keith Comos. Thank you for being here. Hey, it's great to be here. Uh, so Keith, <laughs> well, uh, you've written two books, I believe, on, on centering on Golden State. Um, what brought you into that? Well, I am a technology guy. I, I have started businesses. I've worked for businesses using my technical skills. And I was looking for something to do with those skills that would give back to the community or do something good with them. And I found various things. And one of the ways that, that really sort of enriched my life was helping find missing persons with some of my technical skills going through some of their social media forensics and, and stuff in the family and stuff that law enforcement didn't have the expertise to do. And that led toward cold cases. And when I came across the Golden State Killer case through a friend of mine, it was a really interesting, multi-year, multi-generational almost, crime case that spanned the entire state of California, spanned over 12 years, and it was really an interesting rabbit hole that I went down. And it went to, I went to the extreme of making a website, helping make a website about this case, and then that led to a book. And it's the kind of case where you just keep peeling back layer after layer, and there's just so much mystery and so many interesting things inside of it. And it was always a case that felt solvable, so I always felt this drive to help move this case forward. You said it, you, you always felt it solvable, but it went for so many years. Um, of course, we know now with the DNA who it was, but uh, what, what made you think it was going to be solvable? Was it the DNA itself that you thought would come around? It was. Again, with my technical background, I saw that they had DNA, and I saw the potential of all of the new DNA technology that was coming onto the scene. Some of it was used in this case, and some of it wasn't. But it seemed like it was only a matter of time before technology caught up to this old case. And it seemed like it would be soon, five years, ten years, who knows? Uh, you know, we didn't know. But it seemed like technology would catch up to it within the victim's lifetime. And some of the victims and survivors were from the 1970s, and they're getting on in years. And it was important to have this thing solved before they passed on. And it seemed like that was going to happen. And it was just, there were a lot of exciting things going on behind the scenes. And it was just a very exciting and interesting case. So, uh, well, uh, uh, yeah. And, uh, I mean, the killer himself could have been dead by now. He was getting on in on years, too. So it's something we might have found out about but never brought him to justice. Exactly. This guy wasn't exactly a health nut. He was out there living a high-risk lifestyle a lot of law enforcement officers assumed he was dead, but it would still be important to identify him. And actuarial tables from insurance companies and whatnot said that this guy could be between 60 and 75 years old. So while there was a high chance that he was dead, especially because he had stopped his offenses, there were no more offenses that could be tied to him past 1986. So a lot of people thought, well, he may have met with an untimely death, and it, it's hard for some of these types of killers to stop. We're learning more and more that they can stop and they do stop, but a lot of people thought he was dead. However, because he could be between 60 and 75, there was a high chance that he was alive, and it was important to find out either way. Yeah. Now, what, what makes them, what gives them this, this age range whenever they say that he's going to be between 60 they're kind of guessing that he started killing, let, let's say, at age 20. I mean, how did, they, how did they go about finding the age? There were a lot of things that went into it. A lot of it was based on witness descriptions, behavioral analysis, profiling that was done in a, a law enforcement office in Florida 
later on in the case, they added some extra resources to the case and did extensive profiling and said, well, he's got the emotional maturity of somebody in his early 20s at the time of the crimes. That doesn't mean that he was in his early 20s, but he could have been. We're finding out that some of these killers start later in life, some of them start earlier in life. We really didn't know, but a lot of the idea of his age was because of witness descriptions and how they described his physical characteristics, which nobody really ever saw his face, but it was the way he was built and the way he moved and the way he would jump fences and evade capture and ride his bicycle at high speeds and be able to outrun different officers when he was being pursued. There was one FBI agent that pursued him in fall of 1979, and the Golden State Killer smoked him. The, the FBI agent was in a car, and uh, the, the killer was on a bike, and he was able to evade capture. So he was a very, he was a spry uh, individual, and some of that went into the age profiling. Mm. Okay. I, see, I see you've written uh, uh, the second book here that just came out in June, um, The Celia Ransacker. So uh, what, what was the purpose of this book? And what, it, it, Like this is about a different spree that happened that the same Golden State Killer did. It's interesting. When we got into the Golden State Killer case and started researching it, there were offenses, home invasion rate cases and murder cases spanning from 1976 to 1986. In his first attack, which was in June 1976, this guy seemed polished. He seemed like he knew exactly what he was doing. He got away with all of his crimes. And the theory was, this wasn't his first attack. He had to start somewhere else. And a lot of different investigators throughout the 1990s, the 2000s, were looking at different crime sprees and different types of offenders saying, could this be him? Could this be him? This guy was never caught. Did he evolve into the East Area Rapist Golden State Killer? And one of the, the offenders that bubbled to the top of that list was somebody named the Visalia Ransacker. And this was a person who operated in Central California, 200 miles away from the first Golden State Killer attack. And he committed over 100 burglaries. They were sexually motivated, just like the Golden State Killer attacks. And this guy was never caught, and he actually committed a retaliatory murder. He was in the process of kidnapping a young woman. Her father intervened. This guy hung around and just shot the guy dead, just out of, out of cold blood, out of callousness. And it was the same type of callousness that was on display in the Golden State Killer offenses. So there was never any physical evidence or anything to tie these two cases together. It remained an interesting possibility. After the, our Golden State Killer book came out in September 2017, we began immediately researching the Visalia Ransacker case very heavily. We had a lot of information, a lot of extra access to this information, so we started looking at it. We dissected every attack, every burglary, every move that we knew that this guy made, and it started to become apparent to us that this was the same offender, and a lot of other investigators had come to that same conclusion. And that was an exciting thing because it adds so many different data points to help find out who this guy actually was and help explain where he came from and how he evolved. And that's what's interesting about the Visalia Ransacker case and as it goes into the Golden State Killer phase is you can actually see a serial killer evolve because we have so much information on both. And that's a rare thing because these are rare individuals anyway. And it's a rare thing to actually see that individual Evolve, And when uh, Joseph D'Angelo was identified through DNA as allegedly the Golden State Killer, we found out that he lived 20 minutes away from where most of these Visalia Ransacker crimes occurred while they occurred, and law enforcement found other evidence during the arrest, so the cases were actually tied together in the process of our writing this book, and we were able to release it under a different title. It was originally going to be Case Files of the Visalia Ransacker, we were able to release it as Origin of the Golden State Killer by Celia Ransacker because mm. these cases had finally been tied together. So just to make sure that I'm keeping it all, all straight in my head, you said that one of the first killings by the Golden State Killer seemed polished, practiced, like he, you know, almost expert. Would that would it be fair to say that it was because he was actually the the ransacker? 
and he practiced and practiced and then evolved into Golden State Killer. That's exactly what it seems happened. He got he cut his teeth doing home invasion attacks and burglaries in Visalia. They were lower risk because most of the time his his prey or his targets weren't home. So he started out peeping. He graduated on to robbing, uh, burglarizing homes where people weren't home. He graduated from there on to trying to enter and entering homes where people were home. Then he had a confrontation with a police officer, and he was unmasked during this con con uh, confrontation. He wasn't identified, but his face was seen. So that was the last offense in Visalia. About six, seven months after that, the East Area Rapist Golden State Killer attacks start occurring in Sacramento. And those were just home invasion rapes. And then he graduated from those. Once he seemed to get comfortable with those, he moved on from those into home invasion murders. Hmm. What, what do you think... So each one of these phases he was in was a number of years. Um, what do you think caused him to change districts and what he was doing? Like, because I don't think in his mind he was thinking, well, you know, he's doing the uh, home invasions at Vasilia, and then he didn't look, oh, I've graduated, I've done this really well now, so let me move into Sacramento and start home, home invading raping now. Uh, what do you think was the thing that changed him from one event series to another? Some of it was organic, and some of it was, does seem to be strategic. Um, organically, he was, he started out peeping in Visalia, he did these burglaries, he kept upping the ante, he kept doing riskier and riskier offenses. As he was upping the risk, he was also alerting the cops to his presence. The cops were getting closer and closer to him, he was having more close calls. He was unable to commit the types of offenses that he wanted to because as soon as he committed one burglary one night, the cops were out in force. Sometimes there were two dozen police officers in a small area looking for him, and he had to abort for the night. So mm -hmm. he changed jurisdictions partially because he could no longer do the types of offenses that he was ramping up to in that area that he had been in, so he went to fresh hunting grounds. But part of what he also was doing was he did sit down and think out, I'm about to, I'm, it's getting too hot for me here. I need to change over here and then change what I'm doing a little bit, just enough so that it's not connected to what I've done before. And this jurisdiction 200 miles away will have no idea that I'm over here doing this type of crime now. Because we do see a clear-cut pattern of him doing mostly burglaries in Visalia, then he does mostly rapes in Sacramento and Northern California, and then when he begins actually murdering people intentionally, he had some retaliatory murders, but when he starts entering people's homes with the express intent to kill them, he actually moves 325 miles down south and begins doing it there. And so he's, the, the offender, Joseph D'Angelo, does have a law enforcement background. He's got over 400 hours in the academy. He's got Navy training. He's, he thinks like a police officer, and he's thinking, I can scramble things up and, and keep things separate if I keep moving around. We saw in Northern California, when he would commit a few rapes in one jurisdiction, he'd then move to a different county and begin committing some attacks there. Then he'd move to a different county. So it was part of his uh, MO, I guess, part of his strategy to keep on doing what he was doing. And this guy was dedicating every detail of his life toward committing these types of offenses through his, his training in the police academy, throughout where he would go and what, what he would do, and even what he would do as a profession, he all of it was geared toward committing these offenses better. And also it makes sense because back then we didn't have these huge databases like, like VICAP or NCIC, and agencies really didn't share information, so you couldn't really set a pattern. Exactly. He took advantage of this weakness, this, this poor communication that existed in this poor level of technology, and he exploited it. And he knew that this jurisdiction would not talk to that jurisdiction. 
there was some there were some areas where he offended where the police there refused to cooperate with other jurisdictions that said, "Hey, I think you're a, our same offender is is over there. I think he moved over there." They would say, "No, he's not here. Um, we're going to investigate this ourselves." And by the time he was out of he committed his offenses and he was out of there, he was on to somewhere else. And he also took advantage of the fact that the statute of limitations for rape crimes was only three years at the time. So if he moved into one jurisdiction, committed a few rapes, and then moved on, after three years they would throw out their physical evidence, they would throw out some of their files, and they would stop investigating. So he was home free. So that was another reason why when he committed murder he had to move so that his offenses wouldn't be connected and that all of this intelligence wouldn't someday be gathered together and help identify him. And he was successful in this. You, I wouldn't say you've got to give him credit, but you have to understand what you're up against. And this guy thought things through. And he, he took advantage of everything, and traditional investigative methods couldn't identify him. What do you think the, was behind his series of, of, you know, the killings and, and all this? Like, what, what drove him to do this? Because you're saying how it's really well thought out. He's planned it, and he's doing these, you know, at first ransackings and then rapings and then into the killings. Was there a motivation that he had in mind? It's really hard to say. Now that a suspect has been identified... Everybody's combing through his life, looking through that for that elusive answer and, and trying to figure out why. It's hard to say if there's any spe- specific trigger or anything that really drove him to do that. What they categorize him as is sort of an anger retaliatory type of offender. There are some offenders like him that try to fill something that they're missing in their own lives. There are some that try to create a certain sense of loss in other people's lives similar to what they've experienced, there's something about this offender that seems to be motivated by anger and control. And they they say a lot of these sex offenses are about power and control, and he's sort of the epitome of this type of offender. He would enter a home, and he would eat the victim's food in front of them. He would tear their house apart looking for personal items. He didn't really steal anything of exceeding value. He wouldn't steal their most valuable jewelry. He wasn't motivated by personal gain in in any way. He would take a monogrammed money clip. He would take a wedding ring. He would take certain personal items from these offenders. And he he was lashing out. He was being retaliatory against these people. And there were there was an immense amount of anger in his offenses, even way back in the burglaries and where he was destructive for no reason, where he would do things to people in people's homes just for no reason. There are some cases in Sacramento early on that appear to be this same offender. They haven't been tied yet, but the family dog was beaten to death in several instances. And in a lot of these cases, they were just simple burglaries. They had the same M.O. as this offender, and with the exception that the family dog was beaten to death. And and one of them, that the dog was trying to hide under the bed as he was being beaten to death. You could tell by the way it was found. And there's just an incredible amount of, of anger and hatred and disregard for other people and, and, and other lives that was present in these offenses. And I don't think we'll ever be able to explain it any more than that, because this is not something that any of us can relate to. So what was the basic MO? Like what what did he actually do when he uh when he was uh, right from planning until the actual event? Maybe describe how how this went. Terror was his his game really. He would enter a home and speak to his victims in a way to where they were convinced that they were going to be killed. He and and later many of them were He would usually go in and awaken his victim or victims, uh, he attacked a lot of couples, with a flashlight beaming into their eyes in the middle of the night or early morning hours of the night. He'd have the woman tie up the man with shoelaces that he provided. And he'd stand there and issue threats, pointing a gun at them. 
He'd tell them that he only wanted food and money, which was probably to lull them into a false sense of security so that if they cooperated, they wouldn't be hurt or killed. He would say, do this or I'll kill you, do this or I'll kill you. And they felt that compliance was the way that they would survive the night. And then after the woman tied the man, he would tie the woman's wrist together behind her back. He'd tie her ankles together. He'd retie the man's wrist that the woman tied so that he couldn't get free and she wouldn't tie him lightly. And he'd tie the man's ankles. Then the offender would rummage through the house. He'd look through all of their drawers. He would tear towels into strips to use as blindfolds. He'd turn off thermostats or anything that made noise so that he could hear them moving around if, if they got free that he could hear the approach of, of any law enforcement or anybody else. He'd prepare the living room, so to speak, with low-level lighting, and sometimes he'd rearrange the furniture. And then he'd retrieve the female from the bedroom, and he'd tell her that he needed her to help him find her purse so they could take the money or something like that, some kind of ruse. And then he'd take, once the female was in the other room, he'd take dishes from the kitchen, and he'd stack them on the man's back, and he'd warn the man that if he heard the dishes move, then he'd kill everyone in the house, which some, sometimes included children who were asleep in their bedrooms. And the children usually didn't wake up. This guy was very quiet. And then he would sexually assault the woman in the other room. And he'd often stop to eat in the kitchen. He'd eat in front of her. Or he'd ransack the house some more in between assaults. He'd check on the man a lot. He was nervous about the man getting free. And he'd issue threats continually through a harsh whisper. And he wore a different mask and different articles of clothing to almost every assault. And because the, the victims were tied up, blindfolded, they had blankets over their heads sometimes, they never knew when he left. They couldn't call the police right away because they were bound so tightly. And, and he'd cut their phone lines. And he, that was his M.O., and it played out the exact same way time and time again. And then when he moved down to Southern California for his attacks, he started bludgeoning them to death at the end uh, of these assaults. And which they say is a very personal, very anger-fueled way to, to kill your victims. There's no distance at all. A lot of offenders need some kind of distance, like with a gun or some other kind of weapon. And so his attacks were very scripted. He didn't really deviate from the script because he planned everything out. He even planned their stalking. He would stalk them out sometimes for weeks at a time. A lot of times he would first choose a neighborhood which offered different ways in, in different ways out, and had a lot of shading, not a lot of lighting, had a lot of open green space where he could go across it on foot and therefore evade any vehicle pursuit because they would have to take several roads to get across the school or the park or wherever he ran across. And he would also call them on the phone. He would call them, and he wouldn't speak. He'd call, and they would pick up, and they'd just hear silence or maybe light breathing. And they had no idea that, that this was a sign that something bad would happen to them. And once he figured out, he used these to figure out people's schedules. He used them to make them a little uneasy, uh, which didn't really serve a purpose, but it must have served a purpose for him. He must have gotten off on, on a, the little bit of terror that he was causing. And he would begin to visit their home physically. A lot of times they would find their side gates open. And this is all before the attacks. They'd find their side gates open. They'd hear somebody scaling the fence. They'd find footprints. And they didn't think a lot of it. A lot of people thought kids were going through their yard or taking a shortcut or something like that. And they had no idea that this was a sign that something could happen to them. And then he would, he would attack. And then even after the attack, a lot of times he would call them and threaten them in harsh whispers. One victim, he called her 25 years later. He called her in 2001, and her attack was in 1977 or 1976. And that's, that's a long time to retain. The, a lot of times he'd steal their driver's licenses, so he'd know exactly who he was attacking. And that's a long time to, <clears throat> to go after somebody and to keep them in mind and to still relive that terror that he inflicted. So it's really all about control. Every bit of this is about control. It is. It is. So I, I got to ask this, though. As, as you were describing the MO, um, I'm wondering at what point did the media get involved? Because if this became a pattern, especially the phone calls, the phone calls are risky. If the media 
started putting it on the news, hey, you know, we, we have, you know, this killer or this ransacker, and he tends to call people. If you get a call, you need to contact the police. And and did the media ever do anything like that? That's the thing about this case is they withheld certain things, and that was one of them. And one of them was also the fact that he would often leave side gates open. And a lot of people look back on that and they say, this was a failure on the police's part, this was a failure on the media's part. A lot of people who used to live there are furious, and a lot of people who were, were attacked are furious. They said, this happened to us, and, and why weren't we notified that this was a sign that he was operating in the area? And it was not publicized that he would do this. A lot of things about his attacks weren't publicized. The police thought that, 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 that they could catch this guy. They were going to catch him in the act. Then they started, he started changing jurisdictions. The, the police force in Sacramento, where he offended the most, changed detectives frequently, and there was not a lot of continuity between the attacks as far as law enforcement personnel and crime scene technicians. And it just, it, it was typical 1970s police mm-hmm. force with all the pluses and the minuses. And unfortunately, we can look back on this and see a lot of areas where the pluses and the minuses affected this case. Because yeah, I, I do, you know, being a member of law enforcement, I do understand the need to keep certain things to yourself. That way, you know, whenever you do go public, you know, you get every weirdo out there calling in saying it was it was me, it was me. You know, I would keep certain things like, you know, he stacks dishes on the man's back. I would keep that. But if it's something preventable, like this man will call you and just breathe or he'll make threats, the public needs to know that because that's preventable. Hey, I just got a call and there was nobody on the line. It was just a bunch of breathing. Then, you know, doggone it, Keith. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I do, yeah. It's frustrating. That is definitely one of the frustrations that I share with people that, that I've spoken to regarding this case. One of the investigators told me, well, it was the era of crank calls. This was happening to tons of people. Some of these calls may not have been related. They happen often enough to where we know they were related. Maybe some of the investigators at the time did not know that these were related. And a lot of times the investigators didn't know which kind of questions to ask. They didn't say, oh, did you receive these types of phone calls? Some victims reported it many months after the fact. When he would call and threaten and say, do you know who this is? Obviously, they knew who it was, and they would report it. But I, I do think that that was one of the failures um, that that we can look back with hindsight and, and we can say. Now, they did host a lot of community meetings, and they they talked to couples and women about, you know, when to comply, when not to comply, how to fight back, those types of things, how to how to be safer in your own home, and. Um, but there, we can always look back and say there was a lot more that could be done, and the phone calls and the open side gates in particular uh, were two of the things where if they could go back and do it again, th- some of the, ch- the course could be changed possibly by some of that. Um, yes. You mentioned that he had an affinity for um, shiny objects and pocket change. What do you mean by that? In his Visalia ransacker phase, which was over 100 burglaries, he stole coins. He stole a lot of coins. He stole jewelry, personalized jewelry. He would steal a single earring from a pair of earrings. And the police at that time, they were looking at this and they were saying, this has got to be a bunch of kids. Who else steals coins? They're going to the arcade or something with this. But he would consistently do this over and over and over again. Sometimes he'd just steal pennies. And <clears throat> you can't really look at that and say, well, he was doing it for the value, especially with the earrings. He was taking one earring from a pair. And that is, is virtually worthless. Um, it's worthless to the victim and it's worthless to him. You can't really pawn it as an offender because the, the police can match it with the other pair, with the other earring in the pair. So we look for psychological reasons for why this could have occurred. And one of the investigators that, that I talked with for a long time about motivation and whatnot, um, she came up with the theory that he was just trying to instill a certain type of loss in his victims that he himself felt or he himself experienced. This wasn't the real focus of what he was doing, 
but he was taking a coin collection, something that they had spent a lot of time building, and he would also steal redemption stamps, the old grocery store redemption stamps. He would take things that they spent a lot of time collecting and some care and putting together, and he would take it from them. And sometimes he would discard these items outside, just a couple of houses away, just to show that he, they weren't important to him, but they were important to them, and he was going to take something from them by stealing their hard-earned time and hard-earned collection. And as far as the single earring goes, it, it's more of a, a nuisance type of a thing, but it, it's something that the victim often found later. They often found, oh, one of my earrings is gone. This guy probably took it. So it was another jolt of terror that they would feel later. It was to show them possibly that he wasn't doing it for the money or he'd take both. He was doing it just to jack with them. And it, there's, it's just a psychological thing. It's almost a game. Once he moved into Sacramento, he still did some of this. And sometimes he would leave items that he stole at one home. He'd go down the street and break in and leave them inside another home. And it was to show that he was here, he was there, and he was everywhere. And it, it was all a mind game. It was all control. It's, there's a little bit of, you can almost say, a sense of humor behind some of this, and a sick sense of humor, of course. And it's, it's a very psychological thing. It's a very psychologically based offender. And back in the 1970s, we're talking about a small town in Visalia. We're talking about a small town police force. They were ahead of their time in many ways, but nobody was equipped for this type of offender, this type of, of uh, tenacity that the offender would show, and this type of deep psychological layering uh, of his crimes, and they couldn't predict where he would be, they couldn't predict what he would do next, they didn't know what his escalation pattern would look like, and so when he committed some offenses, they couldn't tie it back to him. And he spent so much time and so much effort on fulfilling some very odd psychological uh, needs inside himself that he wasn't the typical criminal and they really couldn't keep up. So, so Keith, and now that they believe that he's been captured, what do we know uh, about him that matches the, the, the police's thoughts of the time? There were a lot of people at the time that thought, this guy is very forensically aware. There are over 300 crime scenes, counting burglaries and, and whatnot, and he never left an identifiable, identifiable fingerprint. That is a lot of dedication to not leaving a fingerprint, and it, it made people wonder, did he have a print on file somewhere? And this guy obviously knew how to prevent leaving prints and how to cover them up if he did leave them, how to wipe them away. He also, there was one particular point where a couple of investigators thought, this guy knows exactly our level of technology and what we're doing, because when a new iodine transfer type uh, technology came out to lift fingerprints from the human body, he stopped taking off his gloves during the sexual assault. And that is that was somebody who's up to date on forensic techniques. That's what people thought. So... When Joseph D'Angelo was identified and arrested, uh, identified through the DNA and arrested in connection with this case, it didn't really surprise a lot of people that he had law enforcement training and that he was a law enforcement officer himself. Um, in fact, he was a, a cop from 1973 through 1979. The Visalia Ransacker case and the East Area Rapist case, all the burglaries and all those rapes took, case from, took place between 1973 and 1979, and then the murders took place between 1979 and 1986. So he was a cop throughout most of his criminal career, and then when he changed from home invasion rapes to murders, people thought, what kind of personal trigger might have gone on in this offender's life? Well, mm -hmm. his last home invasion rape attempt was in July 1979. Joseph D'Angelo was fired from being a police officer in July and August in 1979. He was caught shoplifting in Citrus Heights, which was one of the neighborhoods that the East Area Rapist defended in, and D'Angelo was caught shoplifting uh, a hammer and dog repellent. 
which are uh, all things. Uh oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's that's called a clue. That is that was definitely a clue. And this guy, he was a cop up in Auburn, which is about twenty five miles to the northeast of Sacramento. So he was he was outside the dragnet basically. People were looking for somebody who lived in the Sacramento area, because that's where most of the offenses were occurring. And even when they were looking at law enforcement people, they were looking at Sacramento guys. They weren't looking in at Auburn people. But this guy was arrested with and uh, caught shoplifting those two items. And he he was well to do. His wife was a lawyer. And it was like, why was this guy shoplifting this stuff? Why wouldn't he want to be connected to this? Why? Um, it was it was kind of mind boggling at the time for a lot of folks. He was actually tried. There there were some proceedings against him for this in Sacramento. And nobody made the connection between this guy potentially being the Yasseri rapist and this guy, uh, you know, being responsible for the crimes and this, this guy who shoplifted. And, but, so he was arrested for shoplifting in July 1979. The next known offense from the Yasseri rapist Golden State Killer was in late September 1979, and it was an attempted murder. He, invent, he uh, went 325 miles south of the Sacramento area. He invaded the home of a woman and a man. He tied them up like he usually did, and but he did not say, do this or I'll kill you, do that or I'll kill you. He said, I'm going to kill you. And he said, I'll kill him, I'll kill him, and he just started chanting it and chanting it. The woman was terrified. She thought, well, I can lay here and be killed, or I can try to run away. So she got up and she ran out the door. He chased after her, grabbed her, brought her in, at that point, the man who's in the back bedroom, he runs out. Golden State Killer goes out, out after him, basically. And uh, the woman takes off again. This guy's lost control of the crime scene. Very rare for him. Mm-hmm. He runs away. The FBI agent who lives next door is woken up, chases after him. We touched on that a little bit earlier. Golden State Killer gets away. But his next crime, he, he does not let his victims get away. He They start to resist, and he actually shot these the next two people to death, and then from then on he bludgeoned his victims to death. So there was a little bit of an escalation pattern, but we, when we were looking at this case, we were looking back, what happened, something must have happened in somebody's life in July or August 1979 for the East Area Rapist Golden State Killer to change like this, because it was a jump. It wasn't a smooth escalation pattern, it was a jump. So when G, uh, D'Angelo was identified and this all of this came to light, I thought, it was like, wow, this is really interesting. There, there's a parallel here. There were a couple more parallels. There was a murder in 1981 and, 19, and a murder in 1986 that were committed by the Golden State Killer. These were his last two known crimes. When looking at Joseph D'Angelo's life, he had a daughter born right around the time of the murder in 1981 and then several months after the murder in 1986, and those were his first two kids, and then he had another one born in the early 90s, and there's no known offense tied to that, but you look at those those times when they interlock in that, that odd way, and somehow the impending birth of his children were a trigger for him in some way, or a last hurrah, or something. Um, you know, if Joseph D'Angelo ends up being the guy, you know, there's a DNA match, uh, he's match their DNA, so, but we still have to say allegedly the guy, but um, there are so many things that interlock, and then of course he's got a Navy background, and people looked at the knots he would tie and say, a lot of those are nautical knots, this guy could have a, a background in that, but you look at when he was offending, it was the Vietnam era, there were a lot of people on the list who had uh, a a background in the military, so that didn't narrow it down too much, but all of these different things. And then the kicker, of course, is this Visalia Ransacker series looks like it's connected, and then you go back and you look, D'Angelo lived there during the Visalia Ransacker case, then he moved to Sacramento area during the East Area Rapist case, and the, the timelines there just match up so well. And if all of this had been in a computer, all of this had been available through public records and whatnot, back then, then this case could have been solved through traditional means. But obviously it was not. He knew enough to live far enough outside the dragnet and and keep himself from being tied to this case in any meaningful way. Do, do we know of any ties between uh, the killer and any of his victims? Like personal ties? Did he know any of them? We've really, really looked for those, and there haven't 
really been any. And we've asked, now that there's a name and a voice and a face, other victims, did this guy ever intersect your life at all? Do you remember him at all? Did you even see him prowling? And all of them have said no. It, it, apparently he allowed enough distance between himself and his victims, and he attacked fairly randomly. And as you know, that's, that's one of the harder cases to, to crack, is when somebody does that. And so he never slipped up that we know of in the sense that he attacked somebody that he knew or that knew him. Was there any particular type of people he was aiming at or a type of um, house or family unit? or uh, Was there any sort of things that you can tie together with any of the victims? The victimology in this case is very interesting because there aren't very many ties. There are some people that have the same type of occupation, such as, as nurse or pharmacist. There were some people that went to the same school, but that would seem to be more of uh, because of the area that, that he was offending in. He, he would stick to the same types of areas. Looking at the victims as far as socioeconomics, as far as demographics, even physical attributes, there's just not a lot of overlap. He seemed to attack based on geography and favorable locations and favorable geographical crutches and points that were around him, like a school, a creek bed running behind the house was, was a very, uh, I guess it would put you at high risk for one of these types of attacks in the sense that he would traverse those creeks a lot, the, the cement canals and whatnot that run through almost any neighborhood, and he would peer through back fences apparently looking for vulnerabilities and looking for women who would be alone or couples who looked like he could attack them. He seemed to attack based on opportunity, vulnerability, and favorable geography, more so than anything in particular about his victims. One thing we have noticed about his victims is that none of them were overweight. Um, none of them were above a particular age. I think the oldest one was 41. So beyond that, there, there are no physical attributes that would really, that could really be tied to any of these particular victims, which made it even more difficult to predict who might be at risk and who might not be. What, have you heard anything about um, the people he knew uh, and his family and other cops that he worked with? Is there anything that's come out about that? And, were they surprised, or did they know it, and what was the feedback? A few have come out and said he was quiet, he was prone to a few angry tirades here and there, we didn't really know him. Some of them have talked to the police and talked to no one else. The family has been very quiet, they've cooperated with police, but they aren't giving interviews or discussing anything publicly. There's not a lot known about who he was and how he interacted with people. The people who worked with him from, from 1990 onward until uh, this year, he worked at a grocery store distribution plant in Roseville, which is near Sacramento, working on trucks and fixing their trucks and sort of supply chain type stuff. And not a lot of people there really knew him. One guy that, that took pictures for our book and, and worked with us a lot, he actually worked with him, it turns out. And he says he worked with him back in the 90s, and he doesn't really remember him at all. He rem remembers that he was there, but he doesn't really remember anything uh, in particular about him. This guy was a loner, just like the profiles predicted, in the sense that he was uh, standoffish with people. He, he didn't really have a sense of humor from, from what people are saying. He didn't interact a lot. He didn't socialize a lot. One person remember, remembers him dodging... Uh, the camera a lot during company Christmas parties, um, just really light anecdotal stuff, nothing with a lot of meat on it. Um, this guy really pretty much kept to himself and kind of lived inside his own head from the sound of things. And, and it makes sense. You want to be as bland and as camouflaged as possible. You don't want to bring any attention to yourself. Exactly. Well, now we know what you're doing, Kevin. <laughs> yes. Wow, that's amazing. What do you think is going to happen here coming up? Um, are, are they going to try and 
connect him to as many of these cases as possible, or are they just going to try and put him away, you think? I think that it's sort of a two-way street. There are a lot of cases out there that share some similarities, and they're, those jurisdictions are now contacting uh, the appropriate people in California saying, we've got this case, what do you all think about this? You, you know about the Golden State Killer, does this sound like him? Can we run his DNA on this? Now his DNA has been run through CODIS and everything, um, so the possibility of, of future DNA matches on, on unsolved cases is low, fairly low, but there are no doubt some other crimes that he's committed that, that aren't tied to this. There are some people coming forward, and then there is some work being done by current law enforcement looking at different areas where he's lived and worked and saying, well, there's this unsolved murder here. Um, are there, is there anything that we could do to see if there are similarities, see if there are any matches? That kind of work is, is secondary to the, the jurisdictions that are all ramping up for prosecution. Prosecution, of course, is the main thing on everybody's mind. So many jurisdictions have prosecutable cases because he committed murder in them. And they're, they're all trying to figure out where are we going to try this, what's, what charges are we going to bring against them. You know, you guys are talking about politics and true crime in y'all's intro, and there's a little bit of intermingling between the two, obviously. And uh, yeah. some, some jurisdictions want to be the ones to put them away, obviously. And so there's a lot of trying to figure out what can we get them on the easiest, what can we do. Um, it's still in the very early phases. This could go on for five, ten years because there's so much, there are so many crimes and there's so much evidence in this case, it's not going to be a quick process. And a lot of people who follow the case, they're like, "Why? we've got a DNA match, why can't we just expedite this? He's 72 years old, let's put him away. Yeah. Um, but, I, I, it, you know, we've, we've all followed a lot of, of big cases and it's just not that quick. Yeah. And you don't want this guy to have grounds for appeal, and, and there's just a lot going into it. I think they should just uh, appoint him in Jeff Sessions' job. And <laughs> 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 wow. Okay. Well, this has been great, and uh, we uh, we're gonna. Keith Comos has been our guest, and um, we're gonna have your books linked on our website as well, uh, so people can just uh, do one click. And do you have a website yourself? goldenstatekiller.com okay and we'll make sure that gets up um, again it's been this is a really interesting uh, conversation you could just uh, talk about this for hours so um, but thank you very much uh, for being on the show well thanks I appreciate it and uh, thanks for discussing the case and I'm glad we can finally talk about an arrest to find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back. 